when I first started, people would be like, you're nuts. No one's going to be interested in this kind of thing. A common human mindset is that like challenge, it's hard, but it's good for you. Welcome to Fruiting Body Podcast with your host, Brendan. And today we have a last minute guest that has just showed up. This is Thai Talk with Patty Jenkins or Thai Talk with Patty Jenkins. Pat, um, we started filming. He told uh, the beginning of his story of how he came to Thailand and got into what he's doing. Uh, the power went out, so the audio file was corrupted. This is going to be a pretty quick podcast. We're going to keep it around 30 minutes. Um, and we're going to speed through a little bit of his life story a bit quicker because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe. If you enjoy this content, share with your friends and family. That'd be much appreciated. So without further ado, let's get this started. Okay. Thank you, Patty, for joining us again today. Um, let's throw it back to you and um, just let us know a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and kind of what brought you to Thailand. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Brendan. It's yeah. awesome. The studio is absolutely epic. Yeah. So I'm Australian, born and raised in Sydney. When I was 17 years old, I was given the opportunity to... Uh, go do some volunteer English teaching in the northern parts of Thailand, about two hours west of Chiang Mai in a very small village called Hoi Tong, which is now my like second home. Uh, I lived there for about nine or ten months, and after about two months of living there, I felt super alienated and super isolated, and I had this epiphany where if I learnt Thai, I could way better acculturate into the local place. And so I went on this mission to learn as much Thai as I could uh, and to the extent where I almost wanted to become Thai. I didn't want to hang out with any other foreigners. I didn't want to be associated with anything foreign. And I only wanted to hang out with Thai people. So uh, I would go for periods of up to three weeks where I didn't speak a word of English because I was living in this dormitory uh, with only Thai students. So I, I just fully dove into the place and acculturated massively to the point where now I speak relatively good Thai. Uh, to be honest, there's a lot of Farang out there who speak way better Thai than me. They just don't put themselves on the internet. Well, yeah. I mean, it's pretty... For, for you to get that level of Thai, and you said you're only here nine months. I mean, that's pretty spectacular. I mean, I've been here six <laughs> years, and Hans, how's my Thai? D, uh, D Mac Mac? <laughs> my D. My D. My D. Um... Now, when you're living with the, these people, uh, now it's just so, Thais. So, no, it was, so it was actually, I should preface, it was uh, the Karen Hill tribe. So they, they call themselves the Baganyo people um, in Thai. They'll say Gariang. But uh, yeah, so they're not Thai. Um, they they come from an ethnic diaspora and uh, they speak a different language, but they also speak Thai as well because they're kind of naturalized Thais up in that area and they... Um, you wouldn't, if they moved to the city, you wouldn't notice really any difference. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I mean, did you pick up a little bit on their natural dialect? Yeah, I did. I did. I, I do know enough to, Is there anything to make you, a few shock. Like, um, like uh, the difference between like Swati Cup and. Oh, it's completely different. It's mm. like a completely different language. It's not like Thailand has a few dialects, but this is just a completely different language. But there is like the, the Northern language and the Isan language and the Southern language. But yeah, you can, uh, you can. I mean, you can only do so, yeah. so many things at once, right? Yeah, I've met, I met, uh, I did some hiking up in Laos, and then I met some people from uh, the Han tribe, mm. and it's more similar to Chinese. Yep. Um, it's interesting, these dialects, and, and essentially, what people don't realize is these people, these tribes, they're nomadic, essentially. Mm. Like, they don't have a border, they don't have a country, they don't have a flag, mm. which maybe, I don't know if you would compare that to Isan as well, like, it could be its own country. I mean, it's, it's, they are oh. completely, uh, the language is much different than Thai. Like, and they'll say that certain people, um, speaking Thai to Isan, they can also not understand each yeah, other. Can sure. you speak on a little bit more of that? Cause obviously you know the language much better than us. Well, I, I, what I can say is that currently within the, on the, the, the border of Burma and Thailand, um, there is the state called the Karen state, which is in Burma. And there's been constant fighting between, the military and the Karen military mm. for their independence there. So as you were going, as you were talking about before, they are trying to establish their own country and it's been happening for a long time there. Um, but yeah, generally with, with, with languages, I mean, there's so, such a distinct part of your identity, right? So um, trying to become your own independent state seems like such a, 
obvious thing to want yeah, to do, right? And it's the same in countries like Spain with uh, ah, people from Catalonia. Catalan, right? right? Yeah, yeah, same, yeah. Probably the same. Co- a lot of people don't. I mean, Canada, Quebec, Montreal, same Flight thing. Flight for independence happens yeah, all over the world, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> do you, what part of you do you consider yourself Thai or is it just a second home? No, no, I do not consider myself Thai. I consider myself 100% Australian. Okay. I think I went through that period early when I was like 17 or 18 where I wanted to be Thai. I wanted every part of my being to be Thai. I wanted to hang out with Thai. I wanted to go to Thai university, do this. There's, the older I got, the more I realized I, it's actually way better to be like a foreigner who really deeply loves Thailand, in my opinion, because the reality is I'm never going to be Thai. Look at me. Like, like it, that's, that's mm-hmm. my belief. I'm never going to be Thai. But goddamn, I can really love the place, appreciate it, and show the parts of it that a lot of main media would never show. Um, and that's always been my incentive. So I'm, I'm a proud Aussie. I love Australia. I think it's an amazing country and I love living in Sydney, but I also love Thailand. So it's a second home for me. Your, throughout your entire life, I mm. mean, it seems like you've taken on this Thai project as well of like all or nothing, almost like a black belt in Thai if we <laughs> compared it to jiu-jitsu. Was there anything else in life? Like when you take on a certain subject, are you all or nothing? I'm pretty intense. <laughs> I'm like, so like what else could you share with us like besides tie that you've you know you go all in i mean like like high school exams for a start like i would have just studied so much for for my my high school exams recently i like um, i'm really into my running so i ran a half marathon recently and trained really hard for it anything where there's like an achievement which like people will say i can't do it i i often have an incentive just to 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 prove them wrong where but does that not, come from though i don't know i don't know i think it's like a desire i think like once you achieve one goal, it's like, like even starting YouTube, right? For, for one, like who would have thought ever that you could grow a channel to more than 100,000 subscribers with over however many million views. Mm-hmm. If, when I first started, people would be like, you're nuts. You're completely nuts. Well, no one's going to be interested in this kind of thing. I think once you, the, the, a common human mindset is that like challenge, it's hard, but it's good for you right? Like we love challenge. Humans love challenge. That's how, how we progress for so long. And I think I'm one of those people who love it. I get really bored by just like watching Netflix at home. I'll stay at home on a weekend and be like, I hate this. Mm. Or, I, I need to go outside and go for a run. Or, and it's intense. Or like I need to go out and socialize with someone. Like I love socializing with people. I don't see that as a waste of time, but like just, just kind of normal things that like other, the mainstream just to do, like getting home, just like popping on the TV. I, I, nowadays, I do not like that. I don't find any enjoyment out of it. I don't find any satisfaction out of it. And I think it stems from that, that challenge attitude. I really like it. Yeah, I, I was listening to another podcast you did with a, a friend. Mm. Uh, it's uh, Johnny Boyle. Johnny Boyle. Yeah. Uh, and your, your first goal essentially was to hit 3,000 subs. <laughs> well, that happened pretty quick. When you were learning Thai, did you set goals and I need to get to this level? And how do I objectively measure that? No, I don't think so. It was very natural progress. And it was only when I had particular moments where I understood something that previously I would have never understood that I realized I'd I'd gotten to the next level. It was a very natural progress. I was 17 or 18 at the time. I didn't really have any of that mindset back then. I think my mindset's changed a little bit since eight years ago. That was probably the stepping stone to become a bit more like how I am now. But when I was 17 or 18, I was just having fun. I was just making new friends. I was in a new place, a new culture, experiencing everything for a first time. If I was to go at this age, I'd probably have a completely different experience. Who knows? I maybe would never have gotten to the same level of tie as I did back then, to be honest. Yeah, I think when you're that, when we're in that, we're that young and you don't have many responsibilities, you can take these, you know, these projects on and and you become essentially a sponge. Yeah. Um, To fast track, because we would stick around much longer, but again, we lost about 10, 15 minutes of content. Mm at the beginning. So just to fast track a bit. Now you you after your your gap year and your yep. time spending up uh, in this Chiang Rai and these hill Chiang tribes. Mai, Chiang Mai. Sorry, Chiang Mai. Yep. Uh, the hill tribes of Chiang Mai. Yep. And you go back to Australia. There's yep. a 5-year gap before you begin the YouTube yeah. channel. What challenges did you kind of take on at that point cuz I'm going to assume you did you just go back to your desk job doing analytics or I, you're like, I need another challenge. I need a goal before you took on YouTube. No, well, I went back to study first of all. I okay. went back to study because I that was my gap year in between high school and university. So I went back to study. I had some serious, weirdly enough, I had some serious back issues back then. Three and a half years of just chronic back pain. Um, and I didn't really do anything during that period except try and get my back better. And I eventually found the solution after a long time. But I still kept in contact massively with my friends back in Thailand. I kept a close connection to Thailand because I can read and write, that helped a lot because I could like speak to them in messenger and on chat and whatnot. 
and I always had a deep connection to the place. Like I, I never forgotten. And some of my best friends are here. So I definitely stayed in touch. Um, and I think it was only once I hit that kind of nine to five grind that I realized that I need a creative outlet here. And I love languages. I love creativity. I love people and I love Thailand and I love Australia. So I was like, why not? Why not? I started watching YouTube at that time and I was like, let's, let's give it a crack. If, if other people can do it, why can't I? That's and you kind of just you stepped outside of your comfort zone and massively you had i'm assuming no knowledge in terms of media what equipment to get Let's zero just go for zero it. zero i borrowed my friend's camera i didn't do any thumbnails at the start i didn't even know what a thumbnail was i didn't know how to edit videos i didn't know literally anything i just started watching a little bit of youtube like three months before that and i was like if they can do it like why can't i and I just went out. I guess that's an example of just kind of mm. taking on challenges a little bit. Who was the team at that point? And how has that grown? Team. <laughs> well, like I've got a few friends, really close friends who help. Like, well, someone's filming. Film, right? film yeah. me, and I'll and 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 besides that, like I just do everything myself. Now, when you when you take on that that type of project, yeah. the, the guys behind the camera. Is there, I don't know if I, if you're able to answer that or yeah. if this is even a fair question, but like, is there agreements? Hey, we're in this together or you're helping me or no, how, how it, did that work? It's, it's, it was definitely established that okay. you're helping me, um, to a point where I would start to pay yeah. them a, a bit of money. Yeah. At the start, it was all purely just like, Hey, can you help me? You're a mate. Can you help me hold the camera? And then it kind of was like, okay, this is getting a little bit more serious. So we got to organize some stuff. But to be honest, it's still pretty, pretty like raw, <clears throat> raw, like it's not. Did the equipment evolve? Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's where, a, where, where did you go from and what are you using today? Like, uh, what's in my camera bag? <laughs> what's in my camera bag? I use a Sony A6400 with a Sigma 16 millimeter lens nowadays. Whereas back in the day, I, I don't know, I just used my mate's camera. Okay. I don't even remember what type it was. So yeah, it, it has evolved slowly. The, the audio equipment, the mic and audio setup is literally exactly the same as from day dot. So the, the it, it's from audio, day dot. What, what is that? The, the audio equipment that I use, like ah, the mic, okay. the handheld mic that I use is still the exact same. Wow. I've got some other audio stuff that I use, like lab mics and all that kind of stuff when I need to. But the actual street mic that I use when I go out and do interviews on the street, the exact same setup as you see today. So there you go. If it ain't broke, don't fix it sometimes. Yeah, eh? <laughs> interesting. I see a lot, a lot of the YouTubers, they've kind of moved. They're using the roads. Like yeah, I, the, use, I use that as well. Yeah, mm. I've got all that stuff, yeah. How did you go about kind of teaching yourself like the audio engineering and the video editing yeah i don't know just bit by bit hey it's probably the part which still to this day i don't fully like that much like i, I do enjoy editing and i like making something into like 40 minutes of raw clip into something that's an amazing story that's a that's an amazing process but after a hundred odd videos it can get a bit tiring after a while so um learning that whole process i just learned from youtube i just learned from by myself, literally, just by myself, just chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, seeing different ways of doing things on the internet, and mm -hmm. trying things myself. It was pretty natural. Yeah, Hans, you can speak on that, eh? <laughs> don't, don't you love uh, editing my videos? <laughs> Our videos. No, Hans is like a partner in this. We kind of work together. Uh, it's a lot of work. That's yeah. why luckily, like, uh, we use these switchers. So there's not too much post-production, but the rendering is crazy. Like yeah, these I mean, if... These videos will be, if, if we went an hour, hour and a half, like it's a 30 gigabyte file. It's crazy. Like his computer, I don't know if it's going to last much longer. He said it's burning <laughs> this, out. This setup is outrageous, honestly. Like I feel like I'm in a proper <laughs> professional studio. It's yeah, outrageous. I don't, I don't know what we were thinking. It just evolved. And I think we're stuck with it now. And I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where I, you, I get those times I want to give up. Yeah. And it's like, well, fuck you. Look how much money you've spent. What the <laughs> hell did you build? I don't think you can give up now. So you we're just no going to keep rolling. You have to do it for at least another two or three years. We're going to keep rolling with yeah. it. So again, with this podcast, I don't want to make it feel too much. I'm kind of changing my tone. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. This is turning to fucking rapid fire yeah, questions yeah. here. No, no, go for it. Um, to take a step back and more focusing on your channel, yep. for anyone that hasn't seen it, and obviously I'm familiar with it, could you explain a little bit about what you do on YouTube and how they would define you? Yeah, so a lot of people would probably... Uh, define me as the annoying Thai speaking Australian guy who annoys Thai people on the streets of Sydney by doing interviews about all different random topics. Um, maybe some people wouldn't be as harsh as that, but I uh, do a lot of content around Thailand, around Australia, the relationships between them around the immigrant journey to Australia uh, through the lens of Thailand. And I do a few different skit style videos as well around Thailand, but a lot of people have now come to see me as this guy who speaks Thai on the internet 
Uh, I'd like to think the channel is a little bit more than just that, but I'm thankful that I have been some kind of inspiration for a lot of foreigners who are learning Thai and for a lot of Thai people learning English. So uh, the channel is really to do with kind of being a bridge between Thailand and the rest of the world, showing a different side mm -hmm. to Thailand that most people never see because the reality is uh, uh, most of most of the media that shows Thailand uh, portrays it in a different way to it actually is. So I really try and get some raw perspectives, some raw opinions of Thai people. And I'm pretty proud of that. Do you think that the answers from the Thai people in Australia are going to be much more open and raw and possibly the same questions asked in Bangkok, people will feel a bit held back because they're in the country? Yes, I think so. And I think generally the Thais who move to Australia probably have more of an open mind just because they've lived abroad. They've had the opportunity to live abroad. They've had the opportunity to compare both cultures, both the West and the East. And so they probably have a little bit more of an informed opinion. That's partly been part of the success of the channel because at the end of the day, when you're going on interviewing people, the people make the content, like their opinions and their personalities and what they say on camera makes the content. I don't know whether if I did it in Bangkok, it would have the same effect. I still think it would. I think once you speak Thai, and once you open up and have a natural persona and can engage with people in a nice conversational way, people are pretty willing to give their opinions on, on, on most topics anyway. Yeah. yeah. Have you had like some interviews that, you know, they don't make it to YouTube where even the people, they might even give the answer and they say, oh, wait a minute, can we not yeah, release it's, that? Yeah, it's, it's happened a bit. It's happened a Usually, bit. Usually like what type of topics does that relate to? Or could it just think, be anything? I think most people could guess in Thailand, okay. to be honest. I don't really need to mention it. Yeah, well, I, 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 we, we, we're the same. Like we yeah. don't cross lines because yeah. we love, no, I, it's different. When I was in China, if this was filmed in China, I would say I love China, but yeah. I probably don't. But no, <laughs> no, no, no. Like I think, like I've made plenty of different, uh, videos that show both the positives and negative sides of Thailand. I don't really hold back with most topics. Um, I think that's been partly the success of the channel because like everyone always shows like Thailand usually pretty positively, come eat food, eat, travel here, do this, do that. But you never really see the raw opinions of people that much. Um, and I think that's why people have enjoyed it. And it's, to be honest, a really good resource for anyone learning Thai. It's one of the only resources on the internet which has subtitles for everything. And, um, using words that you would actually use in conversation. So is, is your audience primarily on YouTube Thai or is it kind uh, of a 50-50? It's probably about 50-50. It's probably like 30% Thai and then 70% international. But I did a meetup, which was probably the proudest part of my YouTube career last Friday. And uh, there was about a bit over 200 people came and it was about 50% Thai and 50% foreign. And that, that was your first meetup in Thailand? Ever. Or ever. Never I've never hosted a meetup before. Would you host one in Australia? Would, 100%. Mm. Now that the, I think I was always just shy. It's kind of like a daunting thing to be like, come and a bunch of like people that I haven't met, come and mm -hmm. join and hang out. But I think I'd definitely do it again. I'd love to do one in Sydney. I think it'd be cool, especially now that the borders have opened up. So a lot of new ties have come across. So it'd be a good way to like welcome them, to see how they're going, that kind of thing. I'd love to do something like that and just kind of create those connections between people like both foreign and Thai. Yeah, I'm assuming with this type of maybe controversial, controversial content as well, you're definitely going to get negative comments. Did that, would that concern you at all in those meetups of some lunatic showing up? No, because I've never ever had a negative comment to my face in public, only on the mm. internet, because that's the only time they're brave enough to make those comments. Do you, do, <laughs> when those initially happened, and I had this discussion with Chris Parker on, yeah, on yeah. the channel, and he said like, at the beginning, it kind of like it, it it got to him, and he says it still does, but he tries to ignore them. How do you handle the comments? Are you replying? Do you just ignore all the comments? Ignore the only ones I actually really don't like is when people make hate comments about the interviewees who I interview on the street. I delete them immediately because, like, go for it. I don't really give a shit what you say about me. I honestly could not care less. It does not bother me at all. At the start, it did a bit. Like I was like, whoa, what the hell? Why they give me so much hate? But and you come to know that they're probably just people living in their mum's basement. Yeah. But um, the ones they do, if they go hard on, a, on an interviewee, like call them dumb or like ugly or just like call them just absurd insults, I'll delete it immediately and probably block that person forever. Because I don't like, yeah. the, the people who interview are, are nice enough to give their time to do an interview that is going to be on YouTube. The last thing they want is comments from random absolute no-hopers giving them shit about absolutely nothing. Yeah, and at least now YouTube has that new feature held for your review. And yeah, it's, it's yeah. quite solid. I, I've noticed a lot of stuff yeah. funnel there because I had Tim Newton on and holy shit, he gets comments. Oh, my God. God. But I, I talked to him and I tried to talk him out of it. He like, 
he answers everything oh. and it all gets to him. I'm like, Tim, why do you care? I do not know why you would bother doing that. Like, it's, honestly, that would drive me insane. I yeah, don't have would, enough time for that. There's no way. And like, man, like, why bother with them? Mm -hmm. Why bother with them? So th this gap and starting the channel, you kind of kickstarted. And as I noticed, I just quickly kind of went through your data. You had some massive videos with 5 million, 1 million, 1 million. Yeah. What was that milestone video where you said, holy shit, I've got something here? Oh, there's a, there's a video that I that wasn't too long after starting. It was probably two or three months. It was called Two Farang Speaking Thai. That's literally it. And it says in Thai as well. Farang Song Kon. And it's, that, it's the... Um, that's it's the with one the girl, with the young girl, okay. not the not, that, not Chris. I found not you girl. from Chris. Yeah, That's not, how not, I not came him. across you. There's a young girl, Ingrid, who's also an Australian, and we very spontaneously made this video. We're like, okay, I'm just going to interview you. It's a, when you look back on it, it's a super low quality vid, but it uh, it definitely took off on the internet. And and from there, I was like, okay, I have to start making videos now. <laughs> I didn't think it would last three months, but here I am, three years later, still making videos and making them in Thailand. So it's pretty surreal. You took a bit of a break recently. Um, can you talk on that? And I think maybe a lot of YouTubers can relate. Yeah, it's an interesting one because I think when you get on the hamster wheel of YouTube, you feel like you need to produce content, one video after the other, after the other. This is nothing new and anyone who's made videos on the internet knows this. But I decided at the end of last year, after COVID, after lots of different things, trying to make videos from home all the time, and just generally a lack of creativity. Um, I was like, I'm just gonna have a break. I'm not gonna tell anyone, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just not gonna make videos because like, I don't want to, I, I don't want to. And I'm not gonna come back until the creative passion comes back. And I'm not gonna come back until the Thai borders open and I can start making videos overseas. So I said, I'm gonna go cold turkey. I had some other things I was doing in my life as well at the time, like going on dates and stuff. Um, <laughs> none of which was successful in the end, but <laughs> and just hanging out with my mates. I moved out into a new place with two of my closest mates mm -hmm. and just hung out and just live life. And uh, I was like, I'm not gonna make any videos for about, I didn't say six months per se, but I'm just like, I'm just gonna have a break. And to be honest, it's been the best thing ever. Um, uh, now coming back, I just feel so much more refreshed. Like I've actually enjoyed the process of making videos again, being back in Thailand, it's been great. But I think um, I, I kind of was forced to look back on why I do YouTube. I was like, why did I originally start doing YouTube? It wasn't just to please, the masses by making video after video after video of like bullshit content. I wanted to do it because like I had this mission of bridging cultural gaps and I also wanted to have fun and use my creativity. And if I wasn't doing that, then why bother continue making videos? So I said, I'm just gonna stop. Um, yeah, and a lot of people did notice it, got a fair few emails and messages and stuff and I would respond, but I was just like, I'm having a break and I'm not coming back until I feel the need to come back. And it's been awesome because now I feel like I come back and I'm just having more fun doing it. Um, but yeah, I think I would, if anyone's feeling that way, I, I wouldn't feel too scared about taking a break. Yeah, I don't. Because it hasn't affected anything. Honestly, it hasn't affected, if you're talking views or whatever, it hasn't affected at all. It's, it's just yeah, come don't, back and- don't let the YouTube gods put the gun to your head, yeah, essentially. Yeah, give me control by the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. yeah I know, and that, that happens sometimes, sometimes we feel, like, I took a break in January. Um, we're starting to, starting to push now. I'm, I'm noticing it way more in the past- three months but mm. again it's like uh some weeks i'm like oh i just don't want to yeah and and and, and you do because you want to please the youtube gods and it's a uh, it's you know it's a, oh, it's a vicious cycle it is um uh, when you're going through your like creative process do you ever get like a writer's block because at the end of the day you're the content you're creating when you're out on the streets and you're asking these um you know maybe political questions or just in general, again, bridging that gap between Thailand and Australia and that, uh, that, that type of lens. Mm. Do you struggle on the creative side or is, or do you kind of do you well, you plan it well, or how do you go about that? That's a good question. I think I, uh, have pretty good creative juices. Normally, um, the topics come to me pretty smoothly. Usually I haven't got too many, too much creative block. I usually go in with a plan because I feel like, if you don't go in with a plan with a video, the video is most of the time pretty crap. Like sometimes I've done some spontaneous videos which have come off really good, but most of the time that's not the case. So I'd always tend to go in with a plan and at least script a little bit, like have the questions that I kind of want to vaguely ask and have an introduction and I can work around that and ad lib around that. But generally I tend to go in with a plan. When you're asking me where the creative juices come from, usually if I'm go for a run at night and 
run run 10 kilometers and usually ideas will come out of nowhere <laughs> well uh this isn't like a let's call it a, a youtube job interview but it, it's a similar question in that sense where can you tell us like kind of about a time when you know you were out on the field and you're asking these questions and maybe something didn't go as planned and specifically how did you deal with that and, and what happened i mean i think the most common thing is just like we saw before is when audio or camera equipment just stuffs up yeah it's happened a couple of times and it is literally the most soul crushing feeling ever when you've done and you feel like you've gone out and made this awesome video then you go off and hear the audio and it's like crappy or the the wires screwed up or something's happened to it that is the most soul crushing thing ever and you literally have nothing to do except power on like you, you have no choice you have no choice those are the things that usually happen there's nothing really happened in regards to bad interactions or or violence or anything like that when I've been out on the street. Nothing like that's ever happened. Thai people are usually pretty friendly yeah, people. Gen- yeah. The audio thing is so annoying. Like I've had things where I've done a kick-ass interview or what I think is a kick-ass interview and then oh, the interview, the, the audio breaks and you just can't get it when it's not in the natural moment. It's hard to redo it. You know? Yeah, no, I've, I've, we're filming um, uh, a mini series. Well, we did it a year ago and we're trying to do this thing called People of Phuket. Yeah. Uh, and it's basically what we'll be doing is um these type of interviews so someone like yourself well it's going to be mostly for people living in phuket mm-hmm. they'll come on the podcast and then we'll go do a day in the life so mm-hmm. it can kind of be video you know recommended and it all connect well but i with the first one we filmed we filmed like four times mm. because the audio on our lavaliers kept like <sighs> jiggling around because we were doing some running and like it was just a nightmare and it's just like oh shit, uh the lavalier audio didn't pick up but we picked it up from this camera and it's like you can't even treat it and it's, it's freaking annoying. Yeah. And then you forget exa- anything you filmed. You're like, what did we even do out there? Mm. Uh, anyways. But um, to fast forward a little bit more, you made the decision uh, to come to Thailand. Mm. You've had your, your, you planned your, your, your meetup and your get together. What was also the intention of, you know, coming on this vacation for a month? I think it was to come and see what it's like doing YouTube and making videos here combined with just coming back and visiting old friends and making sure I really enjoy my time here. I think the reality is with my YouTube channel, the next step would be to probably move it to Thailand somehow if I was going to fully take it seriously. So coming back here has been, I guess, a proof of concept of some sort to see how it's like living here, how it's like being here, how it's like making videos here. But I also just want to enjoy my time here because I love this place and uh, I have so many old friends here and so many old connections that um, that I love catching up with. Uh, I mean, I was just last night drinking beers and drinking whiskey with with my Thai friends um, mm. just in Phuket here. And I was like, far out. Like this experience, just you just can't do that. Like mm-hmm. not, not many people have to ha- can say that they can do that. Like casually go and just speak in Thai the whole time and hang out with just Thai people. It's crazy. Well, I, it's, I, I pinch myself sometimes. It's just, uh, it's, I don't know if we call it third world, but yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm from Canada. And yeah. to be honest, like I living in Thailand, there's more freedom in these countries than our countries. And people don't realize that. I, Yes, for foreigners, I think. Yeah, definitely. I don't know if, if Thais would agree, but it'd be interesting to have that yeah, conversation. I, with I, them. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've never... Looked at it that way, but yeah, definitely, definitely like as a Farang living yeah. in, in, or a Waigoran in China, yeah, living, yeah. living abroad, you, you do have a lot of freedom. Like, um, I mean, for example, like you're saying yesterday, you, you were drinking with your Thai friends yeah, yeah. and it just, you know, it's very raw and yeah. that, that experience there. But here, I mean, the day in the life yesterday is okay. I did a podcast. Mm. I went surfing. We had some beers. I ate some pad thai. I'm on the <laughs> beach and I'm home at nine. That does not exist in Toronto. There's nah. no way. The food culture here, like the nightlife culture is amazing. Just being able to see restaurants open at midnight, 1 a.m. and just be able to go and get a meal is just insane. It's the best it's shit the con- ever. It's the convenience. So hectic. Yeah, the, it's so... Con- <laughs> I don't know. See, I haven't... I've lived almost like more than a third of my life in Asia now. Yeah. So like this is home to me. Yeah, yeah. But... The convenience here is on another level. I don't know if you have this in Australia. I, d- I definitely don't know in Canada, but uh, not yesterday, the day before, my girlfriend had to fly back to Bangkok mm. and she forgot her car key and her charger. So convenient here, I can literally book a motorbike grab to pick up the no. key and charger and drive it to the airport. No. So now I don't have to go. Uh, I don't know if you... Would that work uh, in Australia or no? Uh, I thought you were going to say she, the grab 
took it all the way to Bangkok. Oh. <laughs> I was like, that's why my reaction was like that. I was like, what? no, 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 no. Way. Uh, oh, they probably do. I yeah. just have never, I've never looked that's into it to be honest. But yeah, it's not, it wouldn't be as common as here. That's for sure. Um, this idea of possibly moving to Thailand and um, working on this YouTube channel, would that be a full-time thing? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think for me, I've kind of realized after a while that uh, sometimes mixing art and monetization actually takes the fun out of the art. And uh, when I've gone too intense on doing YouTube and trying to make it my full-time thing, I've actually lost the passion for it. Whereas I think having two things and being able to do two things at once, and I do enjoy my full-time job, um, I think that gives me a lot more uh, genuine happiness. Could so you could work your full-time job remotely. Is that kind of the idea? Uh, I don't know. I'd probably have to transfer here, but let's hope my manager's not watching. Hey. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. I don't know. We'll see. Okay, that's, that's, see the, that's the next. That's the next. Step. That's the next step. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. It's just like, to be honest, the, the channel is Thai Talk with Patty. I've been doing it in Australia for three years and I've done some great things in Australia, but it is limiting. And if I was to take the channel to the next step, I would have to say it would be here. So it would be whether I want to take it to the next step or whether I want to just fade off into the mm, fade abyss. off into the, into the <laughs> abyss and uh, knowing that I've enjoyed my three years on YouTube. Yeah, because I guess in Sydney, your your one of your constraints would I'm I'm assuming be the area in Sydney where you're going to find most type. Yeah, people. I mean I'm going to the same places most of the time. So the like for example, this studio we're doing a podcast, but it's always going to be this backdrop. People have asked to do it on the beach. I'm like, how the f how am I going to move? This? Not <laughs> happening. <laughs> But in Thailand, yeah, like you can travel pretty much everywhere around. For there, sure. So. Like I, yeah. I mean, you walk down the street and there's a story. Yeah. It's content everywhere. Not that like that's what I want to look at it like, but the reality is that's the truth. Like you can make yeah. videos anywhere here and there'll be really, really interesting stories of interesting people around here. There's a lot of people that have untold stories here that I'd love to tap into. So. Yeah, you get a lot of these Thai vloggers here, but they uh, I've talked to a few of them off camera as well, and they tell a different story. Mm. Um, like Chad from CB Media. Uh, okay, so I talked to Chad a bit. I asked him to come on, and he's a great guy. I talked to him, and he's like, he's he's disconnecting from Thailand yeah. on, on the vlog side because he says the comments you just get blown up on. Yeah. And one of the, the main things that he was talking about on the vlogging side was more you wouldn't want to be his friend traveling and vlogging around because he, he might need to drive two hours, but it's going to take him five because mm. you drive by something and you see it. Then you mm. got to loop around. Then you got to film mm. it. He's like, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. It's not, those travel vlog, they're not as enjoyable. If you came over here, would you kind of be travel vlogging around to different regions or what would be the plan? I, I don't know. I've never really seen myself as like a travel vlogger per se. It doesn't really interest me that much. I prefer conversation a little bit more. Hence why I've done a lot of uh, like street interview style stuff and different documentaries about different people. I prefer that kind of style stuff. Unless there was a really good story that you'd have to travel to to see a particular place, I'd probably do that. But Well, well I mean, like if you're going to these like Hat Yai and you're yeah. going to, uh, you know, Chiang Mai, Chiang yeah, Rai, yeah. These, these cities, but now you're having those conversations in those cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just like unique stories mm. particular to that. Like this morning I, I did a, uh, an interview with a tour guide here in Phuket who talked about the effects on COVID uh, the last two years on, 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 on people in Phuket and his job in particular and how he had to go home. And it should be an interesting story. He, he works in an elephant camp and, uh, and do, does that kind of thing. Like those kind of stories you just can't tell in, in Sydney, right? Yeah. Th see, we went, this will connect to that, but we uh, went hiking. I got a, a like a, a, just a little trail over here that goes into the Campbell and Mountains. Mm. So when you get out there an hour into this trail, there's people living in the jungle. Yeah. And there's kids running around and my tie's not good enough, but like, I'm mm. so tempted to get them onto the podcast, but yeah. it'd have to be translation. Speaking of that, like that type of content, like imagine you went there, you could have a legit conversation. Like what the hell are you doing here? I know. Number one, or, and I'm sure you've thought of this No, for sure. or these hill tribes and going back to them yeah. and having conversations with them because there's probably only a handful of people. Number one, that have a popular YouTube channel and mm -hmm. number two, that, speak Thai at your level. If not, you're probably the only one. Yeah. I think I was talking about it with the other day. There's a few people who have like a Thai audience and a foreign audience, but there's not too many people who have Both. the middle audience, which I'm pr pretty privileged to have. And I do want to use that. And, uh, and I, I want to tell the most authentic stories through that and using my Thai language to, to my, uh, 
in my favor is, is, is the best way to do that. Will you be doing any of that when you go up to Chiang Rai tomorrow? Maybe visiting, maybe I'm giving away your YouTube. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. They'll come out slowly. That's for sure. Right. There'll be a trickle of videos over the next few months. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be doing that. I want to make super, super authentic stories with, um, people that I've met over the years. Uh, I've already tried to do that in Bangkok and in Phuket. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to do as much as that as possible when I go up to Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai. That's the aim. Yeah, because you got you yeah. got these big guys here like my mate Nate. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure you're familiar. But familiar. I mean, he's very boom Thai mm -mm. down the middle. Like I didn't even know him until my girlfriend showed a couple yeah, weeks he's, ago. Yeah, he's insanely popular. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of, well, it's kind of like the Farang Mr. Beast in Thailand. Yep, That's exactly. Basically, what he's doing, exactly. which is great. Yeah, for sure. So you're. What's the rest of your trip? You're going to Chiang Mai. When do you head back to Sydney? Uh, well, let's see. I, I, I'm tempted to extend the trip, to be honest. I've been enjoying it so much. But yeah. maybe uh, the, the plan is to go in another two weeks. So I've been here for like a bit over two weeks. It'll add up to about a month ultimately. And then I'll head back to Sydney. And that's uh, where the uh, reevaluation of my life starts to begin. <laughs> Let's not get too deep into that. I think that begins on the <laughs> flight back. Yeah, the most existential time yeah. when you're sitting on the flight yeah, and you're, you're leaving like, Suanapum Airport and you're like, oh. oh shit, what am I doing? Oh, it's rough. Every time I go back to Canada, I like... On that flight, I'm like half, like the second it takes off, I'm like, please come back, turn around. I mean, I, it, it's just, it's hard to leave this place. Yeah, I do love Sydney though. I do love like Australia as much as I love Thailand, but this time has been particularly special. Yeah. Yeah, this, the, Thailand is a special place. I mean, I tried to stay away from like, you know, you've, you've understand enough, like the elephant pants and the tourist that yeah, yeah. goes back home and says it's changed me. It's like, no, it hasn't. <laughs> You're still the same douche, but <laughs> I mean, you get that a lot here where, it, you know, they, they come back with like some sort of gemstone down the middle from Copenhagen and Thailand is, you know, different changed. strokes for different yeah, folks. Yeah. Um, are, are there any sp spots in Thailand? Obviously you're not going to be able to visit that are kind of on your bucket list. Mm, yeah, there is a few. I think, I feel like I haven't explored like Isan at all. Like I haven't been there at all. And I know that's a big place. So it's hard to say Isan, but um, especially because I've connected with so many people in Sydney who are from Isan and they tell me all these different places to go. I'd love to visit there uh, because I think it's like really like the guts of Thailand in many ways. It's a place which is so unventured to and no tourists really uh, are ever told to go there. So I'd love to go out there and make some stories. I don't know which area, obviously it's a massive area. So just saying Isan, but it's got a very rich culture. The food there is awesome as well. So well, it's um, feeding. It's feeding the country. Yeah, right? yeah, I mean, exactly right. The it's the is. agricultural heartland out there, right? In many ways. Have you done any of the historical trails like uh, Ayutthaya, Sukhothai? Have you been up in these areas? Uh, probably not enough, to be honest. I haven't really trod the tourist path enough in uh, in Thailand. I think when I was living here back in the day, I kind of made a conscious effort to avoid anything which was remotely tourist. Which, looking back, is just dumb because some of these places, like. Ayutthaya are some of the most amazing places in, in, in Thailand, really. Like these, these are cultural heartlands of this, this country. So I definitely have to explore it more because currently I've really only gone to Bangkok, Phuket, Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai. And then, but I'll really go hard up in the north and go to some really cool places. So yeah, I mean, I could, wish I could go everywhere. Like there's a, uh, like I'd love to go to um, Chiang Mai Drang, Trang, Trang. You know, train. Yeah, in the, in the south. south. Yeah. yeah, like there's some really cool places there that uh, I've seen on the internet, and it's got a really big like Chinese community and some really cool Chinese dishes. So I'd love to go and explore that area. There's some really cool little islands down that way that are really cool. I've heard. Yeah, there's uh, what's oh, I went down there. I've been everywhere in this country. My God, <laughs> what's that island down cool. down off train? It's like Gorada, Gorada. No, it's it's the it's the super. Uh, the most famous island it's basically you can even get there from Langkawi in Malaysia. Yeah. What's that island called? You know it. Oh, it's like it's 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 <laughs> one of the most famous down there. Oh, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up later. Yeah. Um when you're talking about stories about Thailand and travel and what what not is there do you have a group of friends that can share those stories? Where do you get that information from? Is it coming from your Thai friends? Uh, often coming from Thai friends, often coming from people I have gotten in touch with on the internet who are both Thai and foreign. Um, but yeah, often from Thai friends and people I've known for a while because otherwise I was thinking, even coming back here with the language, that language, it's pretty hard to go out and find local stories, really. Even if you did have the language, you do have to have some kind of connections to be able to like plan something and tell a really rich story. 
so yeah, a lot of that has come through my connections, my old connections and online. Yeah, they're not also just going to open up. For no, no, no. Things. Everyone's like, oh, this guy, this random dude is is talking at me with a camera. Talk, talk about your whole life. Like, no, thank you. Yeah, I, w- I recently went up to Sukhothai. I see, I, I don't think Sukhothai is really on the tourist yeah. trail. It's way, man, it's like Bangkok. It took, it's like five, six hours. Yeah, yeah. No, no, um, definitely we, not. We ripped over to, my girlfriend's from Pit Santa look. And then yeah. we, we went across to Pechabun. Pechabun. Wow. That place is like... Awesome. It, it, There's so much, so much unventured see, territory in this country. It's, it's a hidden gem that I, I shouldn't even talk on camera about. Like, yeah. It's meant for the Thai elite. Uh, when you get out there, it's like, if you thought Chiang Mai is gorgeous, uh, forget about it. Wow. This place is on another level. And it's the mountain towns that go from Pechabun to uh, Loy. Loy and Nan province. Nan. And when you meet these people out there, you'll meet a lot of Farangs that yeah. are doing bike tours. And yeah. Everyone says Nang's the, the most gorgeous, but Pechubun is am- yeah. amazing. Absolutely amazing. Some of the, there's some good vloggers out there. I was following Patty Doyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he does popular. he did all the, the provinces. He's so very you can see the content in, in which you did on that. Yeah, side. yeah, for sure. So we'll we'll wrap it up soon because we're probably we're probably what, forty five? Forty. Oh, perfect. Um I guess like the final, like uh, if you want to share with your audience as well, you're going to be finishing your traveling, you're going back home and hopefully you're coming back to Mm. maybe start something in Thailand. If you want to kind of to this camera, just let people know where they can find you. And if you want to leave a message in Thai as well, that'd be much appreciated. Okay. So the channel's called Thai Talk with Patty. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram. Um, ที่ชมชงที่ชมชงพอดีตลอดไปนะครับก็จริงๆรู้สึกว่าดีใจมากที่มีแบบคนที่ติดตามเยอะและแบบสนับสนุนตลอดโอ๊ยก็พูดไม